Games and Strains! Yo, 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 what's going on to all my video game peeps around the world? It's your favorite stone gamer, your boy Big V, here with another episode of my show, Games and Strains, where we just be smoking and talking about video games. That's it. That's all. You know what I mean? But listen, man, I'm going to let y'all know today is a special day. I got a special guest in the house, but before I get into my guest, let me let you know who the, the pod is sponsored by. It's sponsored by my brand, Sky Zone Society. Make sure you're shopping at skyzonesociety.bigcartel.com. Now, man, listen, I'm so excited today. I got a special guest in the house, man. I've been, I, I, oh man, I, I, I've, I've been a fan of this man for a while and he didn't even know it. Like, I'm so stoked to even be doing this interview today with this guy, man. Like, very, very stoked. I'm here with none other than my guy, Nicholas Ackerblad. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, man, welcome to the show. You know what I'm saying? Thank you for Thanks, being man. here. Man, listen. I'm excited, man. Listen, for the for the people that don't know and are listening and watching, they're probably like, man, who the hell is Nicholas Ackerblad? Yo, let me tell y'all. If you have ever played the classic games of Hotline Miami and Hotline Miami 2 wrong number, you're looking at the man who designed the covers for both. And also, you're looking at the man who produced some songs that was on the great and amazing soundtracks of both games, man. This is the guy that's responsible for when you're playing part one and you just run up in the spots and just shooting and stabbing everybody and your head is just bobbing and just going crazy to the soundtrack. This man is responsible for some of that, man. Nicholas, man. Nicholas, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, dude. Thanks, Big V. Yo. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm really, really honored by that uh, plug. You actually got me a little bit nervous now. Got you nervous? What? Why, why, why are you nervous? Like, speak on that. Why? Uh, I, uh, I don't know. I, I, it's always like the whole, it's kind of daunting, like the whole idea of doing things that other people sort of uh, fall in love with or or like or to whatever extent they sort of connect with it it's always a little bit uh hard to sort of uh, pro process you know because you sort of have a call to being an artist and it's something you sort of have to do at least that's uh, i can always speak for, my, for myself and when that sort of resonates with other people it's it's a it's a weird feeling mm -hmm. yeah it's it's hard to explain and it kind of gives you a certain kind of humility and a certain kind of presence that makes you a little bit nervous but it's not like scary nervous it's more yeah. like when, when you've been on a roller coaster yeah like that yeah. you know you're, you're getting a little bit thrown off like oh okay 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 uh and that's always very very interesting but i'm i'm totally happy that you enjoy it that much like seriously can 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 you tell me a little bit about what you enjoy about hotline miami the violence okay <laughs> <laughs> the Guns violence <laughs> like <laughs> every everything everything there is to like about hotline miami man the sound, like dude like the soundtrack like to that game like I used to be like, I'm an artist too, so I would literally pause the game and try to like rap over some of the beats. Yeah, like yeah. that that's how like that's how much I love the soundtrack, the boat. It's like it's just like it's it's like mood fitting, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. you have to be kind of like, you know, stealthy sometimes, and you gotta kind of be, you know, you gotta kind of run up in there sometime and be quick about everything, hit a guy over the head, grab the gun, shoot, shoot both ways. Man, it's like, like lovely chaos. Yes, it's definitely like almost like playing an instrument, or or maybe like rapping, like you know when you're in the flow. 
Yeah. Like I, I'm shit at rapping, so I'm not even gonna try. But I can like I know how to play instruments and stuff like that. Yeah. And I figure it's maybe like uh, the same way when you get in the flow. Yeah. You know when it's just happening and and yeah. you're almost like vibrating from it. Mm, like yes. do, do you do you feel like smoking weed helps you get into that zone? I I would say yes. Um, as a as an artist, from an artist standpoint, for me, yes, like. Weed is always a part of my recording session. Um, you know, it's fostered creativity. Um, and not just for, you know, vocal artists, but musicians as well. I've been around yeah. musicians, they say the same thing. Um, it's it's just something about it. And everybody's different. It, it isn't for everybody, but for, for sure. those of the like minded and 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 are of the like artistry, so to speak, they know they know what we're talking about. When you get in that yeah. session, man, and you know, you got the light two mic line mic like minded individuals, and we're just sitting there bouncing ideas off each other. Smoke is in the air. We get the recording. You get to playing instruments. Man, we come up with a classic. You know, yeah. we come up with a classic, several classics. You know, yeah. you know and that's that's something you can't also you can't really plan it. It has to happen in the moment. Like, Organic. of course you. Can, Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like you, you can create a good environment, like set and setting and all of that. Yeah. Have the right people present at the right mood and everything. But it really comes down to the moment when it happens. Like, uh, and, and that's what I think is so fascinating with these old people from, you know, like 18th century, like mm -hmm. who, who wrote like these symphonics, take Mozart or Bach, for example, like how they wrote all their music on paper mm. before having it being performed by an orchestra. Like imagine that level of just intellect and art artistry combined into one. It's, uh, I, I just, yeah, just a random thought. Um, I, I just been thinking a lot about that lately because like we, I do music on the computer and like, I can't even imagine writing something on a sheet of paper mm -hmm like that and hearing it in my head before it's happening you know yeah that's that, that's a different type of that's a different level that's a yeah, different yeah. level and and yeah. see and, and with you for the people that don't know nicholas is from uh gothenburg sweden that's um, right let, let's talk about uh your upbringing man how was it you know growing up in gothenburg uh sweden uh and just explain it for somebody like like me who's never been to sweden at all Okay, so Sweden is kind of like Japan in a sense that people have certain, it's kind of quiet. Okay. And people aren't, may, maybe like, oh, it's really hard to explain in English, but I'm going to try it. Bear with me. Okay. Uh, the seasons are very prominent. So when it's winter, it's really fucking cold. When it's summer, it's really hot. Okay. And then you have spring and you have fall. And I think that affects people's uh, minds quite a lot. So like when it's summer, everyone's out having fun. People are more open mm -hmm. and like uh, expressing themselves. And during the winter, when it's cold, everyone's inside and frigid and sort of protect, you know, sort of like a bear that's going into hibernation. So you kind of have to deal with two types of people when you live in Sweden mm. and sort of go with that flow and not try to fight it, which I think also is part of why a lot of creativity is coming out of Sweden because we could, we kind of get the summer where we can unload all our emotions. And then during the winter, you can't really do anything except stay inside because the weather is so, so shitty. So you stay inside and all these impressions that you've had during the during the summer and the spring, you can sort of use them into creativity or if that's what you enjoy. Or you can just binge watch stuff on Netflix or whatever. Uh, so there's like two modes. Okay. Uh, and also growing up, like it's kind of conformed, like Sweden is a socialist or at least it was a socialist com uh, company. <laughs> <laughs> Country. Uh, and it's, it's, it's sort of like you're not supposed to necessarily think you're better than other people. Mm. So it's not like America where you have the American dream. Like if you want something, go out there and get it. Like we don't have that. Uh, 
And it kind of makes you question yourself a lot, I think, especially if you're an artist. Okay. Because as an artist, you have to express yourself. Okay. And it can be it can be very tricky to find that space where you're allowed to express yourself as a weirdo. Because Swedes are used to things, everyone being on the same level in the same way, sort of. Okay. And I think we're just recently exploring new venues of that. Since the world has become more global and we have more uh, inspirations from more countries and stuff. Uh, so, 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 so you really come from like a, a humble background, basically. Yeah, um, I would say I do. Yeah. Uh, even though both my parents were architects. So like I, okay. I, we were maybe emotionally humble, but... I would say financially, I I didn't really have any problems like that. I grew up in a fairly nice neighborhood and and all of that. Uh, but most of my closest friends were from like Gothenburg is very uh, let's say man not polarized like poor people and rich people. It's very like divided. Okay. And a lot of my best friends were living in the ghetto, so to speak. Okay. So, so I didn't really connect with all the white folks where I grew up. I tended to gravitate towards the cultures, like the whole mixed pot of cultures that was in uh, outside of the city, sort of. Uh, in the, I don't know if there's a better word than a ghetto, but that's what they used to call it. Now, I, I like that. I, that's interesting because, like, for me, we, we we use that term over here in the in the States all the time, the ghetto, the hood. Yeah. So I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It just blows my mind because here, we wouldn't think that y'all had ghettos in Sweden. Yeah, we do, definitely. Like, for okay. sure. Yeah, okay. yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, uh, it's, I don't know, it just felt like people were more open there it was uh i could be weird and it wasn't a problem you know and see that's how that's how it is here too you can uh you know when you grow up in the hood or a tough a tough part of of, of, of your state or whatever you learn to be yourself and who you are and it becomes accepted because you're around other like-minded people who who are their own selves too and they know who they are yeah you know? and, and and it's 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 just crazy Every time that I speak to somebody in a foreign country, how similar we are, like miles away, but a lot of similarities. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, everyone's connected. And so we're humans, for Christ's sake. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think I think it's really weird the whole clan society that our modern world has become is just something weird. Uh, it breaks my heart thinking about it, to be honest, but. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. And I mean, I get to meet a lot of people, and also talk to people like you from other other places. In, yeah. And and yeah, there's like really no. I mean, of course, obviously, we grew up differently, and we have different cultures. Like you probably had some kid show, some cartoons you grew up watching, and I had had other cartoons right. growing up watching stuff like that, or what was played on the radio, or how, how politics is working. Essentially. You know, and especially with video games, like, dude, yeah. I connected with people on the other side of the globe back in two thousand one, playing Fancy Star Online. Mm -hmm. and, uh, see, and, and see, me doing my research on you, I learned something else. You know that me and you have in common other than video games. I learned that you, you know, you you grew up liking comic books, like we were speaking on off air. You yeah, know, yeah, exactly, Big um, V. Look, he got the he got the V for Vendetta book, one of my favorite uh, uh, movies. He got the comic book over there; looks real crispy, man. Can, yeah. can you can, can you speak to how the comic books influence um, your creativity in the musical space and in the gaming space? I think it's yeah, it started with comic books for sure. Like just um, how 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 you can like could like mix and match things mm -hmm. i've always loved that about comic books and video games like how it's a cultural outlet where things aren't so refined you know mm -hmm. for lack of better words like it can be very random and almost anything is allowed 
and you can still create subtle and refined pieces of art through those mediums. And it's something that I still love these mediums for and something that I sometimes lack in AAA. And I think that I'm so glad that the indie world started happening back in 2007, 2008, you know, with yeah. Raid and all those games. Uh, Super Meat Boy, shout out. <laughs> uh, where like they brought the weirdness back into games again. And I feel like that's sort of trickling back into AAA as well now, right? I, I would agree, especially um, I'm a big JR, JRPG fan. So yeah, me too. I, I, I play a lot of weird, so culturally weird stuff. You know, it's not weird to me and you, but big Final Fantasy guy, uh, big Star Ocean guy, um, uh, uh, Eve's Eight. You know, I, I I play a lot of things like that. Uh, Ghost of Tsushima. The list goes on. Um, yeah, I can agree with you on that. Um, it's definitely trickling down in the triple A world. Um, even games, uh, you know, we can just talk about the list of games that the weirdness goes on in the triple A world. There's plenty of examples. But I love that part because yeah. I, I love the I, I I love a good weird fantasy storyteller, so to speak. Yeah. Like right. so what what's your favorite Final Fantasy game? Or favorite JRPG for that matter? I would say Mm. I would Tricky say question. Final Fantasy wise, um, I I got I would I would I will admit I got I got into Final Fantasy a little bit later than everybody. I didn't play it on the NES and things like that. Um, I got on it when uh, around like PlayStation three and four. For me, Final Fantasy seven was is probably my yeah. favorite one. Yeah. And right now, this is a sleeper for um, I think in my opinion, but. I think to me, Final Fantasy Stranger of Paradise is also a great one too. <laughs> like I'm enjoying that. I'm almost, I think I'm at the end now. I'm, I'm having to fight this huge boss and it's killing me. But um, I love the story in that. Like I'm really loving that. I did. I and I think I liked it more than I thought I would. Yeah, because it it wasn't just about kill chaos. It wasn't. No, it was not. You know, it it gave a lot of backstory to Jack and and. And uh, Astro, was it Astros, I think his name is. It was just a lot, man, that I love. And I'm super hyped for uh, the Crisis Core coming out in a couple weeks. Yeah. Can't wait to play that, man. But, um, yeah, uh, I love weirdness in the game. I love weirdness in the games. And, and I think the indie world is definitely responsible for bringing it back into the AAA world. Yeah, Because for so a while, too. it was getting a little basic. Um, oh, yeah. A little realistic, so to speak, you know, like like a lot of gray tones everywhere, like Gears yeah. of War, all that sort of face when everything was like burly guys in a gray environment, like yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was your first console, man? Uh, Mega Drive. Mega Droid. I don't think I've even ever heard of the Mega. Yeah. Drive. Oh, say 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 again, Mega Drive. Oh, the Mega Drive. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah oh, got yeah, yeah. it. Got it. Mega Drive. Okay. Yeah, I'll... Mega Droid sounds like some cool bootleg or something. <laughs> something you buy on a market in Taiwan or something. Mega Droid. <laughs> so, okay. You got the Mega Drive. Okay. Yeah, and, Sega yeah, Mega yeah. Drive. What, what year yeah. was that on your first console? What year was that? I think it must have been. 1992 or something 92. yeah so and it was like uh my well, the, parents were 30, 32 bit to... one right of the 32 bit one or was no, it 16 before it was 16 yeah 16 yeah okay 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 so uh so my my parents tried to get me to go to the dentist and i was scared as fuck of the dentist like i did not want to open my mouth so my daddy was like okay you can have anything you like if you just go to the dentist and open your mouth and get it done. And I was like, I want to make it right. Okay. And my mom was like, oh, my God. Why? Okay. Uh, so we got the Mega Drive, and the first game I got with it was Ultra Beast. Ultra Beast. Okay. Uh, which is like some kind of arcade weird arcade uh port yeah i don't think i heard of it 
I mean, you should look it up. It's pretty weird. Like some Greek dudes with like uh, almost no clothes on. Okay. Uh, and it's like a beat em up. So they they walk, you know, oh. from uh, from one side to the other, and they walk and they like fight these mythological beasts. Okay. And and sometimes they get a power up, and then it's like power up. <laughs> and if you get enough power ups, you transform into a werewolf. Mm. And shit goes crazy, and you have like all the like you shoot fireballs with your fists, and it's totally crazy, and you just yeah, uh, and it was so weird. And I remember also the character, like he's supposed to, as you did back in the day, save uh, Athena, uh, like you had to save a girl. Okay. Uh, and I remember she was crying or something at the end, like help me, help me, and it made me cry. Wow, because you were young, or it was just that emotional, like it was just so emotional. Like I was, I'd been fighting all of these weird monsters, and I, and 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 and, and it was so manly, you know. And all of a sudden, there's this girl who's very sensitive, and she's like, "Help me!" And I just, I, I just broke down into tears because it was it was something the emotional range of it just sort of knocked me over the head. Like if you watch a cartoon, it's usually happy go lucky. But here it was like so many things going on. And I was just like, this is, this is crazy. Oh man. It, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a couple. I'm not gonna say a couple, but it is a it is a game out there that made me cry the first time I played it. I cried when I beat The Last of Us Part One. Yeah. I cried when I when I beat that. That was an emotional game for me. I'm, I, I'm not even lying. It's, it's definitely intense. I understand that. I get that. And and you know, you know, we talked about you know you doing work on Hotline Miami and Hotline Miami Two. But before you jumped into that, you were doing work at Short Fuse Games, correct? Oh Jesus! <laughs> you know we got we got you know I did my homework. I did my homework. Yeah, yeah you, you know. did for sure. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah. Well, Let's talk about your time. You know, spent at, at Short Fuse Games because you worked on um, a game called the Colise a Coliseum, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was that, was that your introduction introduction into doing things like this? Yeah, I went to a college in uh, a small city in Sweden called Kvabde, and they have this uh, video game college where you okay, like you you teach yourself how to make video games. Okay, and and after school you could enter sort of like a business program and start your own company. So we were ten guys who decided to do that, uh, and. We didn't really know what kind of games we wanted to make. And one of the student projects that one of the guys in the crew had been making, and it was called Colosseum, and it, it was kind of like shitty. Uh, sorry, but it, it really sucked. But we were like, we can refine this and try to make some sort of multiplayer brawler out of this thing. And we just set out to do it. And, I became the art director, and uh, it just went from there. I'm, I'm gonna be honest, man. I, I looked up the game Coliseum. It looks dope. I want to buy it. Like, <laughs> it was, like it was pretty cool. It looked cool. It looked like a, a dope beat 'em up, like brawler. Like it looked really cool, man. Like I was like, holy shit, where is this at? You know what I'm saying? I was I was proud of it because it, it was pretty complex. Yeah, man. You should yeah. be. You should be proud of that, man. You know, um, ten guys coming together to form a, a a a gaming company, man. I mean, that's not a that's not a short feat, man. That's that that's fantastic, dude. Let me tell you, it was a fucking crucible, like for sure. I'm not kidding. Like two and a half years of crunch, like crushing it. It it was intense for sure, and like we had to learn everything from scratch, and there was no thing like. No, no Unity no, shit yeah, or anything. Yeah. No Unreal Engine, nothing like that. The only thing we had was XNA, like some kind of elevated coding language that Xbox, that Microsoft had put out for their Xbox. So we had to figure everything out for ourselves, make our own tools and everything. Uh, and I did 
all the animations, uh, a lot of the artwork, uh, and yeah. Now, you know, okay. So you let me ask you this: when you you said it took about two and a half years to make Coliseum, yeah. then what is the time frame? Of making a game now independently. Ooh, that's such a hard question. Like it depends on the scope, obviously. Okay. Uh, but for me, I make I make games that took five years and games that took six months. So it really depends on what kind of scope you want to have on your game. So this one game, Kometen, I made with a friend called Erik Sveading for the iPhone. Uh, and it's kind of trippy. I, I think a reviewer called it like a psychedelic Russian child show or something. Like, because it looked so weird. Uh, and you're this comet and you explore space and it's sort of like a spiritual journey. And it only took six months because mm. I wanted to draw everything by hand and, and scan it and sort of get away from digital art and, and try to be more analog. And then me and Eric also made a game called Els Heartbreak, which- Yeah, I, I read I read about that. I read about that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna try to explain that game fully, but basically you can code anything. It's kind of like a hacker game. And I've been playing cyberpunk a lot lately, and it reminds me a lot of Els Heartbreak, how you explore a city, and you're sort of down with the with the whole retro hacker thing, and and we wanted to sort of create that vibe, uh, but make it set it in our own hometown of Gothenburg. I like that. Oh, and okay. So, and those are mobile games or and PC games, so to speak, right? Yeah. Yeah, Els Heartbreak was on PC because you had okay. to, um, you could code. So you had to have a keyboard to be able to have like a smooth coding experience. And what year was that? I think we, we released it back in 2015 or something. Okay. So you go from forming a company with 10 guys at Short Fuse Games, put in some work there. Now, how because see I, I read something I want to know if it's true. When they when when they were in the midst of working on Hotline Miami, the first one, is it true that they used your apartment to finish the game, the product like the production part of the game? Yeah, my they were in my studio. Yeah. Both Jonathan and, and Dennis are close friends. How did uh, that even come about? Like how how do how, how like how do they even ask you, hey man, can we use your, your apartment, man, to finish our game? Like, how does that even come up and come about, man? Uh, we we were just hanging out, you know. We were uh drinking alcohol, doing dr dr drugs together, and uh, just being like young and crazy. And Jonathan had wor started working on Hotline Miami, and um him and De and he showed it to Dennis. And how, and how, how, how old are y'all at this time? Oh, like 2010 so maybe 20 29 something okay okay yeah i think so uh and and they were making it in jonathan's apartment and jonathan's apartment at that time was like i mean it, it was such a bachelor pad like there's like stuff everywhere like no one ever did any dishes and it was like laundry everywhere it was like total crazy very creative but totally crazy and it was like parties all night and everything. And I think Dennis was the, f I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think Dennis was the first who sort of wanted a little bit of uh, focus, like uh, more of like a focused environment. And I had just bought uh, a studio for paint where I could paint and make games. And so they just asked me like, dude, can we like also stay at your place and work on our game? Uh, and I was like, yeah, for sure. I love the whole thing of making things in the same space. It doesn't right, have to right. be, the, we, we don't have to work on the same thing. It's just being the same space. Right. You know, it creates that certain energy and I love yeah, it. Yeah, energy, vibe. Yes, yes. Exactly. Good vibe. 
so they just stayed here, uh, not all the time, but they stayed here a lot. And they didn't have any money at the time, so I like cooked them dinner and stuff like that. So is is that okay? They're using your 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 apartment to finish the game. How does the conversation come up of you doing music for the game and you doing the cover for the game? They just needed a cover. And they asked me if I wanted to do it. And I was like, yeah, sure. Uh, and with the music, I, you know, I've been making music since 97. And yeah, I saw your discography, man. I mean, you got over a hundred and at that, a hundred and eight records. No, <laughs> not Way that many. Well, not that many. Okay, okay, okay. No, okay. I, I, maybe I have like put out seven full lengths or something like that. I can't remember, but uh, I have well over a hundred, hundred and fifty songs that I've sort of. Okay, so more. Already. Okay, okay, okay. You got well more than over one hundred and eight because I yeah. saw you had a lot of albums, EPs, and singles. Yeah, yeah, a lot. Of, there's like a lot of stuff. Uh, singles is like how it I, maybe you looked it up on spotify like the list becomes longer because it lists all the singles and all the remixes and all that crap um but dennis just overheard my song daisuki mm -hmm. uh, and thought it would make for a good intermission between missions like uh, a, a, a possibility for the player to decompress after all the violence. Yeah. Uh, and it worked really well. And then they were like, Nick, yeah, we're going to put you in the game as well. Yeah, you're the guy that's like at the stores and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You're the guy that's like, when I go get the pizza, it's on the exactly. house. Yeah, it, yeah that's man. me. This is so fucking crazy. <laughs> oh my God, yo. I'm freaking out right now, bro. Like, this shit is. I never in a million years thought that I would be doing an interview with anybody <laughs> associated with such a great game, man. Like, That's this so, is crazy. Like, for me, hearing that is totally weird. Like, how being on the inside, being like in the vicinity of in the creation of this series and how many people just loved Hotla Miami. But it, I definitely, it comes down to the, just the sheer geniality of Dennis and Jonathan, like. Who created the game, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. for sure. Like it's just, they were just doing their own thing and they were just in the zone. You know what I mean? Dude, how stoned were y'all in the process of this game? They were not stoned. They uh, weren't? No, no. They made this game sober? Uh, I wouldn't say sober. But, okay, okay, uh, okay. They, they prefer alcohol. Got it, got it. Got yeah, it. yeah. Okay. On the other hand, though, I was stoned pretty much all the time. Yo, man, this is fucking awesome. This is great, man. Yeah. Oh, my God. This so, is getting oh. back to the hotline, Miami, you know, you, so, you know, you, you do the cover and you do some music for it, right? Yeah. It takes off and sells 1.5 million copies. What are, what are your, like, what are you thinking in that moment? Like, did they, like, when you heard what you had sold in total, like, where were you? How did you receive the news? Like, how did it make you feel, man? So, I mean, f firstly, Devolver told us, or told Dennis and Jonathan, and they told me that uh, it had just sold really, really well. And I, everyone was like, crazy. But I sort of knew that beforehand. Because you you knew it would sell well. I was dead sure. Like it just felt so right at the at the right place at the right time. You know, it had the whole because we had seen the movie Drive, and the movie Drive was a huge inspiration, obviously. And that movie just hit off, and it just felt like everyone was going down that zeitgeist, and. It just hit at the right time. And 
I remember Jonathan and Dennis were like, oh, maybe, you know, a couple of people will buy it and we'll be able to pay our rent. And I was like, no, dude, you're going to be famous. You're going to make a lot of money on this. And they were like, no, nah, no, nah, whatever. And that happened. Uh, and personally, I was just happy that a lot of people started listening to my music. Like, of course, because, because as an artist, that's what we long for. Yeah. That's what we long for, to get extra ears and extra fans and supporters. Exactly. But the scary part of it was that there was also a lot of people who had a lot of opinions about things. Like, okay. uh, I remember, because I used a sample from, uh, from like a remix of a uh, Secret of Mana song. And I remember there was a little bit of hula baloo around that, uh, and also like like from like people like labels or no no just from fans and I think some fans also heard Daisuke in game because like that was the hit and uh, and it was from my second album and went back and listened to my previous album and also the album that I had released uh, before Hotla Miami came out. So I had three albums out by that time. And those other songs are quite different from uh, those songs that are on Hotla Miami. So I think a lot of people were expecting more of that stuff. And that's just not how I was operating. Like, uh, I... I'm more accustomed to do, I, I like just doing different things, you know, like curiosity is a key point in my, I like to explore, you know, I just don't want okay. to do one thing. Uh, it's very important to me to do that. And I think a lot of people were thrown off by that and voiced their opinions about it. And I just was a little bit like, oh, okay. Uh, you don't have to listen if you don't want to. Uh, but eventually that sort of, you know, toned down and those people who sort of, a lot of people started feeling that it had opened a door to a musical universe that they hadn't heard before. And my music, I, I, I consider myself like a shaman. So like I want to create spiritual healing through creative endeavors for others like i want to help other people understand their own soul their own emotions through my acts of creativity and i had i got a lot of response from people saying like you helped me through a your music helped me through a depression or your music helped mm -hmm. me through a dark time and stuff like that uh and, and that was I mean, all the money, all the fame. Fuck all of that. Fuck all that. That that's that that's better than money. That's so much better than money. If 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 I helped someone through their rough, because I've been dealing with that shit myself, like, and I know what those artists have meant to me. And if I can do the same, that's yeah. You know, all I'm asking, like, that's that's the <laughs> oh, you know. So. Would you say, with the with the notoriety of Hotline Miami One, it it, it did millions of copies. Would you say that it boosted your music career? Oh yeah, for sure, definitely. That's the sole reason I have a music career at all. I think mm. <laughs> that I can actually make a fair amount of money from it. Like, uh, and it's also opened a lot of opportunities in the video game world. Like. If I tell a producer that I've been associated with Hotline Miami, that opens doors. Yes, absolutely. Your reputation is, has already preceded you. Yeah, exactly. And that's, to me, still 10 years later, you know? Still 10 years later. Like, a couple, it's, it's, a couple, what a hell of a feeling. Got to be a great feeling. I mean, I don't, I don't have anything else to... Uh, Let's say, man, compare it to. 
you know? So for me, this is my reality. And it's it's hard to say it feels great because life is life with all its trials and tribulations. And this is just my journey, my story. And I can only be grateful that I am here, that I am alive, that I am here, and that I get to experience a life, you know? Mm. That's real that's real humble of you, man. I I, I love the the humbleness of you. Um I was already a fan of your work before I even knew who you were at all. But just to see someone who's been a part of something so major to even just come on my small platform is just a, such a huge deal for me. And I, I appreciate that. But like I got I gotta know how you felt Hotline Miami won the IGN Best PC Sound Award. Like, how, how did that, that had to, from from a musician standpoint, man, that had to make you feel wonderful, man. I, okay, okay. Uh, I, I don't care about awards at all. Like, I think awards are bogus. I mm. think uh, you can't compete in art. And I think all young people out there who try to create for themselves a life where they are uh, making art. I think that whole rat race fucks with people more than it gives to the people winning the awards. Because it, okay. it creates this situation where people feel they don't have any self-worth until they have reached a certain perceived level of fame or won awards or whatever. And it fucks with their self-esteem. And, you know... The only thing you need as an artist is honesty and belief in yourself. That's all you need. Like live or die doesn't matter. Of course, you have to pay your bills, but of course. Uh, th that okay. I would say that's the one thing that I really appreciate that I've been able to pay my bills with my art, and I'm really grateful for that. Right. But I think the one thing that really made me happy was in we were in Lyon. Me and Dennis, it's in friends. When we were playing a show with my uh, El Huervo uh, my, yeah, <laughs> persona. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and the interviewers were talking about Synthwave. We were being interviewed by a French, a French magazine, and the interviewers were saying, like, how do you feel being part of creating a new genre of music? Okay. And I remember that feeling was like, wow, okay. These people think that what we have done has has been a part of creating a new genre of music, synthwave. And I remember that was ec ecstatic. <laughs> it was like, okay, fuck y'all. I can do whatever I want. Like, you know, it got to my head. I love the fact that you're such a you're such an artist, poor man. Like I, some of the same things that you're saying, I've said myself. You know, like people have came to me and said my music has changed their lives, and they remember where they were when they heard some of my music. That's that's better than money, and only other artists that are true to the art form yeah. can only can only relate to that. Yeah. You know, like you not caring about any of these awards that you're winning. That speaks to who you are, person. Also, just as as a true artist, you know, because you could easily be easily be like, man, you know, uh, it was great, to, you know, the, to to make this amount of money, and but you you, you are truly focused on the true art form of it all. Like you don't care about winning these awards, man. Like and this is crazy because I'm gonna be honest, like. You you're not even giving me the answer that I thought you would give me. I thought you would be like, "Oh my god!" Like, I, it blew my mind. Like, you like none of this. Like, none of that matters. And everything you're saying, I, I feel, and I can tell this genuine. You know, I can because me just being an artist, being an artist, they get caught up in the money part and and the um the fame, of course. 
and just wanted to have that one song that you're that you're known for, you know, something that can just change their lives forever. Me, I, I'm more about the legacy, you know, about about yeah. about about what I'm leaving behind and what people yeah. are gonna remember me for, and and making time this music, you know. Yeah. And I love the fact that after all this, man, you were just still. The kid from Gothenburg, Sweden. You know how we started this interview, man. Like it don't yeah. seem like the time that you describe then to now that you haven't changed much. Like uh, I changed in that sense. I have I haven't changed a lot. You're totally right about that. I mean, I, I I've changed uh, in other ways. Uh, hmm. I've been exploring my mind and. Of you know, course. My mental, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think my core values have changed, and I'm really happy about that. Uh, but I think I had good idols. Uh, for to be, I don't know. Can you say that? Like uh, idols? Of course. Like I, I think I had good idols. Like I, I was a huge Jim Carrey fan when I grew up. Love Jim Carrey. Yeah, and he talked pretty early on about. He was mocking Hollywood. Uh, and he was talking about fame and how he needed to be become famous to understand that he didn't need it. I mean, it's easy to say if you have it. Right. Uh, same with money, I guess. You can say, I don't care about money. Yeah, if you have money, you, of course. Uh, but th that sort of resonated with me. Like, and also art is something that's my religion you know that's what i care about and mm -hmm. i've been through some rough times man and art has helped me through it and i i refuse to um not respect that you know <laughs> and i think i've seen a lot of people just become caught up in it you know uh also gothenburg is like um uh, it, it has a music scene which is steeped in leftist uh politics i would say like okay uh how selling out is like the worst thing you can do <laughs> mm. so you kind of grew up hearing these things okay okay uh, i like that okay and so it almost i think it almost creates like a kind of allergy towards selling out um uh, yeah so yeah it's just it's creating stuff is what's important like how can i be a better artist that's that's the most important thing and if i have enough money to not have to think about the stress of being poor or like just having food roof over my head all of that stuff basic and necessities then i'm good to go you know that's all do i have, need do you have kids no i don't I want to talk. I want to talk, I, I want to talk about like we, I want to stay on fame for a little bit because yeah, sure. Oh, like maybe maybe you know this and maybe you don't know. Like there are thousands of people that walk around with the Hotline Miami cover on their t-shirts <laughs> and hoodies, yeah. dude. Do you know? Like, do you really yeah. fucking know that, dude? Like. Like, I do circles all the time, and I see that. And, it, and it's like a, it's like a whole thing. Like, if I see a person with it on, like, dude, cool t-shirt, they kind of salute me because they know I know. Like, yeah, what's up? Like, ah, uh, he he know he know about this. Yeah, I know about that. I I know. You know what I mean? So, you like, you're responsible partly. Yeah. And fully for that image, for, for, for both games, dude. Like, yeah. it was that, like, like, especially like, like, but like, your character, like, that is a cult. It's like, people actually get it tattooed on them. Yeah, I, I've seen that, <laughs> dude. Like, you are like, blow your mind, like. Okay. Uh... I'm going to try to dig deep here uh, 
for like for you and okay so so like this um i've always worked very hard and i've always tried to stay true to myself and seeing how that is paying off makes me proud and it gives me hope that it does work and all those people when i grew up who said oh you can't be an artist it's going to be hard how are you going to make money uh, how are you going to live you know it, it's almost like uh, i mean it worked <laughs> You know, it, what if I would have listened to y'all? What if I hadn't followed my heart? You know, uh, man, talk your shit. So I'm, I'm proud, I guess. Yeah, I feel, I feel, I feel proud that I stayed true to myself. Yeah, yeah. So that feels good, uh, and it feels good that people, you know, get something out of it. Really, like that's a blessing for sure. Uh, it is. Um, that's yeah. <laughs> How do y'all even manage to pitch the game to Devolver? Uh, Jonathan had done some stuff for Adult Swim, if I'm not mistaken, and okay, Adult Swim and Devolver was like knowing each other or something, okay. and so I think it was someone at Adult Swim who had a connection with Devolver and uh, they were like, uh, maybe you could pitch something to Devolver. And Jonathan had this uh, prototype of like a top-down shooter uh, where the guy is naked uh, and he runs around and shoots people. And they were like, yeah, cool. This sounds cool. Uh, let's do something. And that's kind of how it worked. Uh, happenstance you know man that, yeah. that, that, like this is so is where is devolver based out of i think they're based out of texas and okay i'm not sure actually yeah i know that uh, nigel uh, lives in texas and i think harry does too uh but I also know they have people in Scotland and okay. Uh, so they don't have like I don't think they have like a headquarter. Maybe they do now because they've been uh, now they're on the Nasdaq whatever. Uh, but back in the day, it was like just a couple of people in different places, sort of having a council of sages online. What are your parents think? Are they proud of you? I think they are, yeah. I think they're happy that uh, it worked out. As it what did. were their thoughts like when they like when when like because they do they know that like no like really know like the level because I know like they don't really get it. They don't really know like how like famous or how like known their kid is. Like do they know that people are really getting tattoos. Of mm -hmm. your art, I I'm not sure. <laughs> and are and are wearing on their sweatshirts and t-shirts. I mean, do they do they really know the cult following that you have helped build? Now? <laughs> I don't think they fully grasp it because they're not into video games, right? right. Uh, but I think as parents, they are happy that I was able to eke out a living for myself, and uh, I I know that I I've gained a lot of my uh, humbleness from both my dad and my mom but i think i think my dad has been the one voicing his opinions about this the most but he he's more he he think i think he more he thinks it's cool that we've worked with like sony and microsoft soft and stuff like that okay because those are the ones he knows. Right, and right, right, right. When I was in uh, L.A. and went to um, uh, the Minecraft guy's party at his villa. Nice. 
<laughs> nice. Yeah, that nice. was so pretty shit. crazy. Hey, there you go. That cocky shit, man. There you that, go. that was pretty crazy. So I, when I came back and I told dad about it, and he was like, oh, the guy who made Minecraft? That's like the biggest game ever. You were there. What? You know, uh, me and Dennis, we were at that party and we looked like a couple of narcs. <laughs> Why? Is it because of what you had on? Uh, Dennis had like a Hawaii shirt with back slick and I had like sh dark shades and like a big <laughs> hat. And all, all the people there were like Nickelodeon executives. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so, <laughs> like did anybody say anything to y'all about the dress code or anything or you just notice how everybody else is dressed that y'all looked a little different. Yeah, and I kind of noticed how, how everyone was avoiding us. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yo. So, uh, it, oh my we God. were just, yeah, we were just walking around looking at that crazy place. And uh, Moon, you know, who made uh, part of the soundtrack for Hotla Miami, he was there with us too. And I remember we were sitting outside on like the villa's sort of like endless pool and a lot of these like posh chicks and, you know, suits, they were dancing to the techno music and we were sitting there and he was like, man, this sucks. Can't you just like draw my portrait or something where I look like this old dude and I'm like tired of life or something. So I just sat there and I drew his portrait while people were partying crazy all around. Uh, and then we just watched the uh, the vista from that from the mountaintop where the villa is situated and, and, and just sort of enjoyed the view. Uh, and smoking a couple of doobies mm -hmm. and uh, having a chill time amidst the chaos. Nice. And that, yeah, that was really nice. That was really nice. Uh, it was a good moment. I remember that. Uh, um, and I think I will remember that for for a long time because it was a really nice moment. Sitting there, drawing his portrait, having the cool vista, being in Beverly Hills. I, I will remember that for sure. That was cool. Now, like, from, let me see, like, I read somewhere that you are very inspired by Silent Hill. Oh yeah, for sure. Can you can you explain how your your inspiration from for from Silent Hill rubs off into some of your artwork? I think it mostly rubs off into my music, like the gritty vibe, the beat okay. yeah. that Akira Yamaoka. Uh, produces is like one of my main inspirations for sure uh, and I think it just rubbed off in that they made a survival horror game which was like fucking with your head like you know yeah, what? <laughs> like really deep throating your cerebral, cerebral cortex yeah but it was also beautiful yeah like there were these moments of serenity and peacefulness and beauty as well. And to me, as a young boy, I was like 18 at the time. No, 16, 17 at the time when I played it the first. And I was like, are you allowed to do this? Are yeah. you allowed to? Because I had been playing Resident Evil before. And that was like jump scares and very like cliche. It was different. Yeah, it was different yeah, when yeah. it came on the scene. It was different. And it, I think Silent Hill just told me, like, you can be different. Like, it's okay to be different and do something weird. Like, you don't have to conform to cliches. You can do, if you want to mix beauty and violence, you do that. If you want to mix indie rock in a horror game, you do that. Like, so, uh, yeah. I, 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 love, I love your enthusiasm just for both. Like I lo I'm an artist too, so I love like my one of my my goals is to get one of my songs into a video game. I'm hoping to do that soon. Um, I don't really know about how to go about doing that, but I'm gonna do my research and try to figure it out. Um, for the artists out there wanting to 
get their music in video games. Say like an artist does get their music in a video game. How does how, how does you how do you go about getting paid from said video game? Uh, I. I'd, I'd say I've been fortunate enough to work with Devolver and Devolver looks out for the artist. Uh, you don't have to do much. They just give you a good deal. Mm. And that's rare. And I think it's important to understand what you need to survive and what you feel your material worth is and value your time and work on figuring out what that is worth in 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 form of material values and stand up for that because unfortunately people i, I won't say people but a lot of People in the industry, I think, will try to get away with as much as possible. And it's getting better for sure. It is. Uh, and more people realize that they have to take care of their artists. Uh, but it hasn't always been like that. And you sort of have to stand up for yourself, I think. Uh, know your worth and stand up for that. And don't think that you will lose opportunities just because you're being honest about what you need. Because if you work with someone and it doesn't feel right, you don't want to work with those people because mm. that's not a healthy relationship. You, mm. you know? I like it. I like it. I can, I can, I can see that. And I, I, I can appreciate someone standing on those morals and like you said you come from a place where selling out isn't accepted you yeah. know same for me you know I come from a place where selling out isn't accepted you know you always want to stay true to who you are just like everything that you've been speaking on and it's so dope to see someone who's had so much success as you still be so humble man it is, it is, it is, it is dope man it, it really is man I think part of it also has, thanks, man. I think part of it has to do with uh, Mary Jane, to be honest. Okay. Because I believe that it makes, if I would have been on alcohol or, and cocaine, so I think those are substances, substances that fuel your ego. But I mm. think that weed or cannabis makes you humble in uh, like you question yourself in i mean not everyone does but i do and i think a lot of people with me do that like it's like with hallucinogenic drugs as well like everyone's connected and all that stuff i think it creates uh, it teaches you it can help you teach you humbleness i think like mm. uh alcohol is like uh, uh, i think snoop dogg has talked about this too like <clears throat> man i don't want to hang out with no alcoholics like, yeah uh, I think that has helped, to be honest. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, many things um, helps you be... I think, okay, like this. If you're humble, you're going to last longer. If you're mm. humble, that means you're humble towards yourself and you're humble towards the people you love. And that's how you build relationships. You don't build relationships through anger, force, or self-absorption. You become lonely. And I don't want to be lonely. <laughs> I want to be a good person for, for me and for the people that I love. Any plans on Hotline Miami 3? Can you speak on it? No. Not going to happen. <laughs> it's not happening. I can guarantee that. Uh, D Dennis and Jonathan are working on something else, though. They are. Okay. Uh, okay. But it's not Hot Club Miami 3, and it's not going to happen. They sort of closed the chapter with the uh, number two. Uh, okay. And I, I I imagine it would be really hard to sort of open that book again and try to do something new. 
like because the bomb goes off at the end everyone dies yeah yeah it's like yeah. Maybe they will revisit the same universe in the future, but in a toll from a totally different angle. In Especially a, a, with you know, I had to ask because you know we have the next gen systems out. I didn't know if they you know might want to cook up a hotline maybe three for next gen. You know, I don't you know. <laughs> sound, it sounds like a great idea to me. I be they can take my money today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't. Th that story arc is finished, but something that is set in the same world might happen. You never know. You never know. But uh, I just want to touch upon a little uh, quickly about what you talked about before, like how to get paid. You were interviewing Rat Vader a while back, right? Yes, I love. I love him. That's my guy. He's my dear. He's my my best friend and my close colleague. We've been working together and. We are close friends. We live close to each other. I love him. And I know that he's been through those struggles a lot. Like, because he's been, he's worked with bigger companies a lot more than I have. And he, he has had to stand up for himself a lot. And I've learned a lot from him, both okay. creatively, but also how, uh, how to practically handle all those stuff. Uh, okay. So I just want a big shout out to Red Vader, Oscar Delius. I love him so much and big shout out. Yeah, big shout out to Red Vader. He, he he actually told me about you. Um, he actually, you know, is partly responsible for his interview. Thank both. I want to thank both of y'all before we get out of here, man, because, you know, I met him just by a, a tweet that I made about how I love the gunk and the soundtrack for it. And we asked, he, he, you know, he, he found it and he contacted me. I interviewed him and he said, man, I, you know, my friend made some of the songs for Hotline Miami. I'm like, no way. He was like, maybe you can interview him too. And then I reached out to you and it just shows how strong the universe and how networking can be, you know, with like-minded individuals, man. And I appreciate both of you, man. Um, thank you just for coming on, man. My platform, like again, it's, this, this it's is so good. it's so huge to me. Like I, I, I love your work. I see your work all the time, and here, here in the states, like you've impacted so many people, mi millions of people, you know. And just, man, just thank you, thank you for what you've done for the gaming industry, and man. Bro, I, we 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 love you out here, man. We love you. <laughs> Thanks. We, we we do, man. Like, keep, I appreciate anytime, it. Anytime you got something new, you want to come on my platform and speak about it, man. I'm always here. And who knows, like, man? Maybe one day I can be out in Sweden, man. We actually can meet up. <laughs> you should definitely welcome, like for sure. Anytime you want to come to Sweden, you can sleep on my couch. I'll take care of you. I promise. Uh, thank you, thank you. But also. Uh, I would love to talk again sometime, but more about weed and video games. Like, would you like to do it? Like how we, how the whole thing, but like playing video games and smoking weed at the same time, what that does for us. Yeah, dude, whenever we can set that up, you're free next time. I would love to have you back on here and we can strictly talk about it. That's a whole great conversation that we yeah. can definitely have. I would love to have that. Please, let's do that. Because I would like to know more about you. Like you had the games and strains thing going on. Like it seems like you're into that. And I want to know more about your views on, on the, that whole thing because I think that's very interesting. Look, let's do it, man. Like, you yeah. know, whenever, shoot me a DM and we'll set that up. And I, yes, let's have that conversation. It'll be like us interviewing each other. And it'll be exactly, it'll be really, it'll be really dope, man. Yes. Exactly. Man. Yes. yes, man. Ladies and gentlemen, my guy, Nicholas Ogblad. I'm trying to yeah. say it right. <laughs> you, got it. <laughs> you got it. I got it right. You know what I mean? Thank you for coming on my show. Go play Hotline Miami if you have not. Hotline Miami 2, wrong number. Go get them on PlayStation, Xbox, PC, whatever you got. Go get it, man. This man is, is a part of the cover, the great soundtrack. Go get his music, streaming on all platforms, man. Go get it, please, man. Yo, 
thank you so much for coming on, man. So much. Thanks, man. UV. You know what I mean? Shoot me a DM when we get off of here, bro. You know what I mean? Let's set let's set let's set that that next that next interview up. Let's do that, man. Yeah. You know Sounds I mean? like fun for sure. It definitely does. You know what I mean? So all my people out there, y'all know how we end this as usual, man. Stay safe and stay gaming, y'all. Peace, man.